If you're looking for a great new read or a great read that's a year old and just getting better, head to theshittheyneveretaughtyou.com where you can buy our book, The Shit They Never Taught You. We've been getting great feedback from the people. Um, everyone, if you've read the book, feel free to go and leave a review. We love, uh, we love hearing it. Uh, LC Judas, he says, The book is made to read and reflect a few pages at a time. It uses an easy-to-read example story style for each concept. Advice is in bite sizes, actionable things, no gimmicks, no buzzwords, no repetitive text. Probably the best book I've ever read in the self-help wow. category. That's, man, we've read some bloody good books. So. And it's, I know uh, LC Judas, it sounds like he's read a lot of... Uh, Books That's in the right. self-help, and for him to say that, we'll take that. For Appreciate sure. that, LC Judas. If you want to read as something that LC Judas describes as the uh, best book in the self-help category, head to the shit they never taught you dot com. Welcome back to What You Will Learn. My name is Adam Ashton. And my name is Adam Jones. Today, we're taking you through the best bits of The Games People Play by Eric Byrne, uh, The Psychology of Human Relationships. This was, uh, I must admit, I thought this was going to be a short and easy book because it's only like 120 pages, but it, <laughs> it wasn't short and easy. It wasn't short and easy. It's a, one of those books that's like a, written in a sort of weird and technical way that you probably need to do a whole bunch of notes and discuss it quite a bit before you get the hell uh, get what the hell is happening in the in the book so hopefully we get to communicate it back to you the listeners and you don't have to go through the um, crawl through the river of crap that we had to to understand what the hell was going on that's right old dr eric he was a psychologist the book's probably what 50 60 years old and uh, he was all about analyzing i guess the interactions between people whether it was in the therapy room where you're seeing them, whether it was at a party, whether it was at the pub, whether it was just two mates hanging out talking to each other. He was behind the scenes just analysing everything people were saying. <laughs> yeah, I, I like the way Eric looks at the world. It's almost like he's walking through a zoo and looking at it as if we're like the hyenas and the apes in the in the cages and that's how uh, he views us, such an objective reality because every time we interact with, with another person, according to him, we're playing some sort of game, aren't we? That's right. He's t- he takes a dim view. He says that everyone's either playing, you know, power games with their boss or sexual games with a love interest or maybe competitive games with a friend. Whatever it is, there's all these games out there that we're always playing. But the big kicker is by understanding and recognizing these games that we're playing, whether it be uh, unconsciously or through reading books like this, you might turn it into consciously, we can start taking control of our responses and develop more fulfilling and secure relationships. Through Eric's observations uh, of these, you know, different social activities, he saw that people noticeably changed, whether they changed in their posture, they changed in their viewpoint, they changed in their voice or their vocabulary or other aspects of their behavior. He said there were always shifts in their behavior, depending on who they were talking to and what they were talking about. Yeah, something that happens in the external environment, whether it be a, some event or a person, and you just start changing and you go into different states. And he says that these different states we move into are called different ego states, and he really groups in into three different uh, psychological categories that we fall into. Yeah, he says that we can either act like a parent, we can act like an adult, or we can act like a child. And so the implications that are that all of us have these different elements inside of us, and depending on what this what situation arises, we'll whip out a different one to suit that circumstance. So a, a child, this ego state, as the name suggests, represents a lot of intuition, creativity, spontaneity, drive, and enjoyment. It's moments of being really playful and silly, or you might start whinging and complaining about something, but. We've all got those moments where we just we feel like a child and, and can be quite um, freeing, I guess, uh, even as an adult. Yeah, definitely. There's, there's good and bad of all of these. The adult, it's necessary for survival. It processes data and computes probabilities. Uh, so you've, you want to cross a street and you're trying to uh, judge how far away is that car, how fast is it going. You're doing all these complex things inside your brain without even realizing and you're just trying to take an objective view of the world. Now, the third ego state is acting like a parent. So the parent has uh, two main functions. Firstly, it enables the individual to act effectively if you were an actual parent of actual children and you know, you're promoting the survival of the human race and letting you know, those little genes of yours spurt around and um, come back in a few generations. And it also makes responses automatic, which might be complex otherwise. So it 
uh, it conserves a great deal of time and energy when you're dealing with certain situations. Yeah, that's right. If the parent says, you know, this is how we do it because that's the way it's done, then you're saving a hell of a lot of thinking time. So all three of those are necessary. You've got sort of the creative, uh, mischievous side of the child, you've got the objective side of the adult, and you've got the I guess the parental side of the, the parent, <laughs> for lack of a better term. And we kind of need all these three different things. Um, and then as we're going to speak about next, depending on what sort of uh, conversations we're going through, we're going to whip out a different ego state. Yes, that's it. So let's just step into the brain of our old mate, Eric Byrne, who's in the zoo looking at the human species as if they're like little robots and taking a step back and even looking at yourself in this way. And that's how we're going to be dealing with the extra episode. So he has this whole field of study where it gets into um, jargon, which we're going to weed out some of the stuff that just makes no sense called um, transactional analysis. Basically, uh, the simple version of transactional analysis is that, well, he calls it every unit of social intercourse is a transaction. Basically, there's a stimulus and there's a response. Someone says something and you say something back to be Mm. quite simple about it. Stimulus and a response, quite simple, our our version of it. (laughs) But the simplest transactions that occur in both stimulus and a response arise from from the adult. So just you're probably acting like an adult and the other person's like an adult most of the day, right? So you walk and you ask for a a coffee from your cafe and your barista and they go and take the order like an adult and then, um, you know, give you the coffee, transaction completed, off you go and you're on for the rest of your day. That's it. It's quite simple. You're acting as an adult, they're acting as an adult, all good. Um, Other ones that are also simple is like a child parent. So say a child, they've got a fever, they stay home from school, they're lying on the couch and they say, uh, dad, can you go get me a glass of water? And then the nurturing parent goes and gets a glass of water and brings it over. The child's acting like a child, the parent's acting like a parent. Mm. Makes sense. Complimentary. Yeah. I'm sure if you've ever taken care of someone, whether it be a, a family member or anyone like that, you've got that sort of same situation. Because- these transactions, they're complementary. They're good ones. They don't cause any conflict whatsoever because they're expected and there's some sort of natural order that follows when you're acting in these ways. Yeah, some other complementary ones, uh, he says is gossip is parent to parent. So both people acting like a parent. Oh, little, little Johnny's doing this they shouldn't be doing and that's very parent-parent. Solving a problem is very adult-adult um, or playing together is very child-child or even parent-child as well. So these are all fine. These are all complementary. There's nothing going wrong here. This is just the normal order of the world. So the crux of where all the issues come is when you have cross transactions, right? So as we said, it's good when you have parent-parent, adult-adult or child-child or parent-child. Things turn to shit when, um, you, for example, have uh, you, you act as a parent and the other person acts like an adult, for example. So I've got, you know, as an example, this actually happened to me, man. When I asked for a coffee uh, from a barista, rather than just taking the order and giving it back. I'd been there um, a few times that day. They said, how many coffees have you had today? You've had you've had five. <laughs> and then I and then that was a cross-transaction, right? And then I was like <laughs> yeah, kind of pissed, gone, I was kind of They've gone off. into parent mode. Yeah. They've gone into parent mode. So I went adult, <laughs> they went into parent, and that's a, a cross-transaction. Um, you know, I could respond like a child and go, oh, I'm sorry, you know, I'm, I'm, I've, got to, I've got to cut back. Um, or I could respond, you know, um, how else could I, or they could not respond like that. <laughs> That's right. Uh, so they, was, could, they could go back to like, uh, ha ha, I was just joking, here's your coffee. I suppose yeah. that goes back to adult mode. And actually, you, you prompted me one as well. I went to, um, I went to, uh, I was post footy. So I was wearing just the, my footy shorts and a t shirt and a, a sleeveless puffer vest just to keep a little bit warm. The um, cashier person was standing right in front of the door. Every time the door opened, a freezing cold blast of wind blew in. And so I was just trying to just be like, oh, it sucks to be standing here in the freezing cold. And then uh, she snapped back at me and just says, well, that's what you get for wearing a sleeveless puffer vest. <laughs> so it was very parent telling me off for not wearing you. sleeves. So yeah, Totally <laughs> unnecessary for just um, those in the retail sector to let their customers feel that way. You're it's pretty funny them. though. We got some stories out of it. <laughs> it is funny like that. So that's the crux. Of it. That's when things go wrong. Like I'll, I've got one more story that's popped in my head then. I was at a mate's wedding. Uh, so we were preparing to go to a wedding and we had to leave by uh, three o'clock to get there at 3.30. I was in all adult mode and I had a mate of mine who was just playing like a child. Like the, the time was running out. Was that out. Was that my wedding? No, no, it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't your wedding. It was a mate, uh, Louis in Brisbane. And um, so I was starting to get pretty pissed off because the time was running out. I was in adult mode. He was in child mode. We started mm. having a bit of a bit of a tension and conflict there. <laughs> I actually naturally went into um, parent mode. So when it was parent-child, it was like, come on, mate, get your fucking shit together. 
you know, order the Uber, do this, do that. And then it actually went back into a, a more natural transaction and then mm. um, everything got solved. So myself moving from adult to parent, albeit subconsciously before reading this book. <laughs> yeah. So we can see there how, you know, different stimuluses prompt different responses and different morphing of our ego states, whether we are whipping out the child, the parent or the adult. Things take another step here, uh, which is where we get into the games territory where what uh, Big Eric calls ulterior transactions, which is where two ego states are used simultaneously. So basically on the surface, you're saying one thing, but beneath the surface, you're implying something else. So one example he says is the car salesman. And the car salesman might say, car A is better than car B, but you can't afford it. And mm-hmm. so then the, bus- the insecure businessman says, I'll buy car A. So yep. it was a very ulterior transaction that we've got two statements morphed into one like car a is better than car b that's just objective that's an adult statement and then the but you can't afford it that's where it goes into parent mode saying you know come on little johnny you can't afford this and that's when the businessman switches from adult mode of saying you're right i can't afford it he switches to child rebellious mode saying actually you know what i can afford it and i'm going to buy it Mm, i like it so at the social level you've got something that looks like an adult adult conversation but as you said it's an adult, sorry, it's a parent child. On, and so they're both not cross transactions. Like you're not going to piss the other person off and get them angry, but you are stimulating the child as expected. I think um, this is probably with the crux of where, you know, that old saying, you wouldn't do it, you wouldn't do it. <laughs> that is stimulating a, a, a parent child, right? And That's trying right. to get the child the out of the other person to make them do something really stupid that they're going to regret. <laughs> it almost always works. It almost always works. <laughs> but um, if we, you know, a more complex version of that is you'd start with an adult adult um, statement followed by a, a you wouldn't do it sort of thing and then you'd actually be more successful at that game, getting people doing stuff they don't want to do. So that's our ulterior transactions and that's when we stack up a whole bunch of ulterior transactions together, that's when we get a game. So a game, as he defines is uh, something where there's some kind of ulterior sneaky quality beneath the surface where all is not as it seems if you just read a plain transcript of the words. And also there's some kind of payoff. So in this case, the car salesman, obviously his payoff is getting that big juicy commission check from tricking uh, the businessman into buying the more expensive car. So sometimes some things might look just like a normal day-to-day operations, things are going as normally and smoothly but in reality someone else is doing maneuvers and actually playing a game so they're not doing these honest requests that might seem like it on the surface but they're actually moves in the in in an actual game so this is like the the used car sales person the insurance representative the poker player they're doing things to lead their opponent into a trap and get them to do something that they don't want to do so from here on he's got a whole bunch of different games and there was like dozens if not you know a hundred different games that he came up with and he gave them all a, a interesting name I guess to make it stick he said this was kind of the first thing that he realized that kind of gave stimulus to this whole field of research that he kind of created where he says this was the first game he noticed and he calls it why don't you yes but and so he said he said he sees this pop up everywhere in relationships in groups at parties just catching up over brunch so he calls this uh, the first person to make a move, much like in chess, you know, white and black, white goes first. So he calls this first person white and white might say to the group, my husband always insists on doing his own repairs and renovations around the house, but he never builds anything right. So she just makes a simple statement here. Mm. Uh, it seems well, somewhat objective. You, well, your friends in the coffee party here are just trying to help out your old pal white over here. So um, black responds, hey, why don't you just buy him some good tools? Maybe that'll do the job. Yes, but he doesn't know how to use them. And Blue responds, um, someone else, why, well, why doesn't he take just a course in carpentry and figure it out? Yes, but he doesn't have time. He's working too hard. He couldn't do another course as well. And Red might come back with, why don't you have your building done by just a carpenter? Hire someone else to do it. Yes, we could, but that would cost way too much. And Green, the last one here, or the second last, why don't you just accept what he does and the way he does it? Uh, yes, but then the whole bloody house might fall down. So he's such a exchange everyone's just sitting there going <laughs> just, just, just what can we do from it? <laughs> and then you got the final person brand is saying something like, well you know that's men for you always trying to show how inefficient they are and how much they suck <laughs> everyone giggles around the table but eventually <laughs> eventually here white is basically the winner white phrased this problem as if it was a normal adult problem 
it sounds as if she was looking for advice and people gave her the advice. So she kind of shifted from a, an adult request into seeming like a bit of an inadequate child needing people's help. So the ego states of all the friends around the table shifted from adult to parent mode and they said, okay, well, here's all these different pieces of advice and what magically found excuses as to why none of them would work. Obviously, any of those would actually work if she tried it. But basically, the game for White here was basically to say, I know just as well as you, if not better, I've tried all these things. You're not better than me. I'm a capable adult as well. Let's see if you can find an answer that I can't prove wrong. And of Mm. course, White wins because nobody could prove her wrong. Eventually, awkward silence. Everyone gives up and they move on. Yeah, it's a, the purpose of the game isn't to get real suggestions and solve a real world problem, even though it's presented like that as an mm-hmm. adult. It's really to for the person to move into child mode. And this does happen all the bloody time, right? If you've given, um, it's probably common for people to read a lot of books and they see different problems around the world and realize there's a solution in a book and you go to hand them that book <laughs> and you go, here's a, here's a solution and They'll probably just next time we catch up with them, just keep complaining about something because that's um this is the the game that they're trying to play. Why would they try and play it, Astro? What's the subconscious thing here? <laughs> well, they're trying to it's trying to prove that hey, you don't know better than me. It's like the child trying to be like, yeah, I'm a grown up too. You can't tell me what to do. Uh, I know just as well as you. And so mm. that's once everybody runs out of ideas and suggestions of why don't you try this. That's when White feels like they've won because they've beaten everybody else. Another example of this same game, Why Don't You, Yes But, obviously where every uh, suggestion starts with a why don't you and it's no, it's not a rejection. It's a, They kind of accept it but then give a reason why it wouldn't work. Maybe a child says to their parent, uh, a literal child says to a literal parent in an adult way just to make it more confusing, the first adult statement, I can't do my homework now because the teacher didn't tell me which maths exercises to do from the textbook. And then the parent might respond, why don't you ask the teacher what exercises to do? Yes, but they were talking to Timmy who was slower than me at finishing his work so I didn't have time to ask. Well, why don't you wait until after class to ask then? Yes, but I had to go and play soccer at lunchtime. Uh, well, why don't you go and check after school? Yes, but mum said I have to come home for piano lessons. Well, um, why don't you ask a friend what exercises you have to do? Yes, but I asked Hannah and she doesn't know either. Uh, why don't you just try a few exercises you, th- you think look interesting? Either you'll do the right ones or at least you can say that you did something. Yes, but some of the exercises are too easy for me. Some are too hard. I need the teacher to tell me which ones to do for my level. <laughs> that, that's Thank that's you. where the child wins and the, the parent just says, okay, little Johnny, go and watch some go TV watch then. TV, mate. <laughs> that's, and the child gets exactly what they want. It's pretty frustrating. <laughs> Almost definitely. Yeah. Okay, so let's look at a few of the other games we've got here. There's another one. Now I've got you, you son of a bitch. <laughs> I like these names. Are, they stick. You mm. kind of remember, yeah? You do. You remember in the games that you've probably witnessed uh, all, all the bloody time. Yeah. Um, so again, we were using chess uh, terminology here. So white opens and black responds. And this is uh, this game, This uh, he calls it, I don't even know, Godspe. Now I've got you, son of a bitch. It's like the classic poker game. Someone gets an un- unbeatable hand. They get four aces or they get the nut flush and there's no pairs on the board. And that's when they... Can, they know that they've won. They know that they've definitely won. The joy doesn't come from winning here, but kind of making everybody else sweat a bit. Oh, they yeah, can just good. sit back and relax and know that everybody's like, thinks they can try and beat them, but that you know that they can't beat you. And that's where you've got the, now I got you, you son of a bitch. That, that feeling when you're playing poker <laughs> and you've got the nuts and you just see them just throwing chips in and they think they're confident and that feeling of now I've got you, you son of a bitch, quite literally, it's a great feeling. So it comes... Like poker can be representative of different situations in life. The sick part of our brain gets pretty excited in some of these moments. There's another story here. (laughs) Yeah, that's right. There was a a person talking about they needed some plumbing done, they needed some fixes, and right at the very start, the the person was like, okay, here's here's what I need. What's the price? The plumber sets the price. They agreed, okay, there's going to be no extras, no charges. Any You've included in this price absolutely everything, equipment, time, anything that could go wrong, Cool deal, 400 bucks, done and dusted. Let's call it that. Mm. The problem comes then when the uh, plumber at the end of uh, the job slips him a bill and he says, oh, actually there was this unexpected uh, washer that I needed, so it's actually going to be $404 for this job. So it soon comes obvious that both the white and the plumber are playing games. So white here became really infuriated and pissed off, called the plumber on the phone and demanded an explanation. Hey, what's going on here? And the plumber 
here would not back down because they got the nuts flush here. And uh, White wrote him a letter criticizing his integrity and ethics and refused to pay the bill until the extra charge was withdrawn. Finally, the plumber gave in. So it became obvious that the White and the plumber, they were both playing games. They, in that pre negotiation period, they were kind of feeling each other out. They were trying to see how much strength the other person had. Uh, it's like, you know, those initial rounds of poker, those first couple of bets that have been put out there, you don't know what the other person's got, but you can kind of make some assumptions about their strength. The plumber, he made that first provocative move when he just snuck an extra couple of bucks in there. The plumber was probably thinking, it's a 400 buck job. If I just sneak an extra 1% on there, he's not even going to care. He's just going to pay it. Mm-hmm. But then the white was like, nah, now I've got you, son of a bitch. You. We've made this deal. You can't back out on this deal. I know it's only a couple of bucks, but White basically takes his whole week of frustrations out on this plumber now just from this one mild indiscretion. He's like, no, we made a deal. A deal's a deal. Don't try and fuck with me here. Now I've got mm. you, son of a bitch. Um, I got rolled in this game earlier this year. So we sent a sample out for a, a builder as well to look at it. They responded with uh, you know, a whole project team of over 30 people with – about 50 different things in the Aconex, they call it, on, online. And one of them at the bottom was, hey, we're not happy with this sample. Uh, you cannot deliver this and this isn't the project. This isn't acceptable for this project. You know, a few months later, we delivered the actual panels, not seeing that, the bottom of the mail. And oh, then yeah. they pointed back oh, to that a few you. months ago. You didn't <laughs> respond to us and this is unacceptable. They saved over 50 grand um, from that specifically. So, That was a great, very well played game by a builder in that that case. They say 50 grand by a simple round of, now I've got you, son of your bitch, Adam. (laughs) Now I've got you, Adam, you son of a bitch. So good. Yeah, it's a a game that you'll see pop up all over the place. Uh, There's another game he calls, Look What You Made Me Do. This is pretty common as well, yeah? Oh, definitely. This is when, uh, you know, you've got White again, the first player to make the move. They they're becoming so engrossed with some kind of activity that they, it tends to insulate them against other people. You know, maybe it's housework, maybe it's gardening, maybe it's working at the computer uh, in your office, maybe it's cooking, maybe it's playing a game, whatever it is, there's some kind of activity where you just want to be left alone and do your job. Mm. And that's when you think, okay, I'll do the vacuuming or I'll do the gardening or I'll um, – <laughs> actually, no, I'm just thinking of a specific example here of gardening. And then suddenly there's an intruder, there's a partner or a child or someone comes in trying to interact with them and then magically something happens, something goes wrong, something mm. slips, and they say, oh, look what you made me do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, the child just coming up to talk to their parent or a partner coming over to you know, ask, can it's I get you a fault. glass of water? It wasn't their fault at all. It was just your reaction was trying to be like, okay, this is you saying I want to be left alone mm. and then just snapping at them to try to get them to leave you alone. Yeah, I like it. There's, uh, I know a couple who are both smokers, but they always try and quit smoking and then – they have times when they both quit and then when one person starts smoking again, the other person gets super stressed and goes, oh, see what you made me do? You made me start smoking again because you started. So it's uh, a game there where the person actually wants the ciggy but that's uses right. the other person as the excuse. <laughs> as the excuse. Yeah, it's a good game as well. Uh, it, there's, he goes into it. He calls this more of a, a marital game. Normally, uh, normally happens between uh, two partners and the name of the game is If It Weren't For You. Mm. So – Let's say Miss Green, she complains about her husband uh, severely restricting her social activities and that's the reason she never really followed her childhood dream of trying to learn how to dance. So they went to counselling and uh, Mr. Green said that although he forbid her from going for dancing, he never really meant to restrict her his wife socially but that ultimately Miss Green was always allowed to do whatever she wanted from his perspective. That's right. So Mrs. Green said, okay, well, finally he's stopped restricting me. Finally I can go to my dance class. She signs up. Actually, it turns out she didn't really have any interest in dancing and she kind of sucked at it. <laughs> so it was just like it was just like that whole time of if it weren't for you, I'd be a dancer. But it re- then she realized actually maybe I never should be a dancer anyway. But mm. I think there's a whole bunch of examples. You know, if it weren't for you, I'd be a movie star. If it weren't for you, I'd be in a band. If it weren't for you, I'd have more friends. If it weren't for you, I'd have more hobbies or more money or more fun and you just kind of blame the other person but really there's no fault on their mm. side. Well, there is, there is some truth to it because there's, there's always opportunity costs in like, you know, you could always be doing a myriad of different things and but yeah, you're right. It's really your own fault, not the <laughs> other person's. You can blame that on. You charge your own decisions. So the, another game here, uh, I have to pronounce these ones, don't I? <laughs> Schlemel. <laughs> Schlemel? It's, it's pretty close. I think it's Schlemel. With the accent. Any uh, people, Yiddish speakers, um, 
will uh, obviously tell us we did this wrong, but there's a Shlemiel, which is like a victim, normally a good-natured fellow, and then there's a Shlemazel. Oh, no, hang on, sorry. The Shlemiel is the, the cunning person, and then the Shlemazel is their victim. There was a, a funny scene on Parks and Rec where uh, they made a joke about how Jerry was both the Shlemiel and the Shlemazel <laughs> pulling pranks on himself, on himself unintentionally. But say, for example, you've got your Shlemiel, and the Shlemiel they might just like spill a glass of red wine so on sh- the carpet. Yeah, I've already confused. The victim <laughs> Shlemiel's the the sneaky one trying to do bad shit, and the Shlemazel's the, yeah. the victim. Gotcha. Go on, keep <laughs> Should we go sneaky and victim? Sneaky and victim. That's better. <laughs> so sneaky. They're just at a party, and then they're drinking a glass of red, and all of a sudden they accidentally spill it on the couch or the carpet or someone's dress or something. Mm. So uh, the, the responder, so the victim responds initially with rage. But they realize that if I crack this shit and start yelling at this person, that person's going to win this game. So the victim here just pulls themselves together, gives them the illusion that everything is fine and being calm and under control gives the illusion that, that she's the winner here. That's right. And then the sneaky one, of course, they say, oh, I'm sorry, it was an accident. I didn't mean to do it. And uh, the victim is obviously going to be like, okay, I'm going to be the bigger person here. It was an accident. You're forgiven. But then the, uh, the sneaky one um, continues to be clumsy in parentheses <laughs> all night and then inflicts further damage to the, the victim's property. They break things, they spill things, they do various kinds of messes, they drop a ciggy on the tablecloth, they pour red wine on the couch. Um, quite specific there. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, both of them are really profiting from the situation. So the other one's getting to be really sneaky all night and the other person's getting to look like a really calm person. That's right. And now this sneaky person, the Schlemiel, basically they can win either way. After that first accident, if the victim shows anger, then White can feel justified in being like, oh, it was just an accident. Why are you being so mean? And everybody will be probably take the Schlemiel side here. And, of course, if the victim shows restraint and says, no, it's fine, you're forgiven – then the Shlomil gets all night to just fuck with all their stuff and they mm. kind of win by having fun by all these little accidents and these clumsy things that, that seem to just happen out of nowhere. That's the, that's the um, lesson from this story. Better off just fucking up <laughs> parties and you're going to win either way. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Um, got it. Yeah, I've got – mate, there was a story. I don't know if I told on the on the pod or not, but about uh, my mate Linny who tried to – there was a Shlomil in his group and he was the Shlomazel. He was the victim. And he took a very different approach to this. He didn't go the forgiving route. So what a what a mate did, Linny was eating a palmer and then the Schlemiel grabbed the ham and cheese off his palmer mm. and like flapped it around in the air yeah. and then slapped it back down on his palmer. <laughs> Have I told that one before? No, you haven't. <laughs> it's, it's a bizarre thing to do, isn't it? Just yeah. to grab someone's ham and cheese and flop it around and then- Was Linny just sitting there? So He, he, was, he was eating the palmer sitting uh-huh. there and then the guy reaches over, grabs it, Waves it around in the air I in he the went middle of COVID. To, yeah. <laughs> Waves oh, it in the air so and then good. slaps it back on his palmer. Yeah, he's winning. He's <laughs> so winning then, so far. What happens next? So Linny's move, I don't know if this is – I think this was child. So the Shlemiel was the child. Normally the parent is the forgiving one, but Linny went child as well. He literally just grabbed him, pushed him off his bar stool, yeah. sent him flying, and basically all his mates were like, Linny, what the fuck? Why are you, <laughs> why are you fucking with this guy? So the Schlemiel wins because they all took his side. So they're saying, like too far, Linny. <laughs> too far. What are you doing, mate? He just flopped right. your ham well, and cheese a, around. Yeah, yeah. Well, you <laughs> failed. Yeah, you can't win that game, can you? <laughs> the Schlemiel always wins, basically. <laughs> whole bunch of games. And I, once you read this book, you start kind of seeing them everywhere. There's a... When I was doing these, you know, post reading this book and kind of half analyzing the world, then I noticed a whole bunch of different games going on around me. I kind of try to name them similar to this bloke. So, you know, one of them is, does my bum look big in this? That's a game that people play. It sounds like an adult, adult interaction. Does my bum look big in this? And the adult would respond with a pure fact of yes, it does or no, it doesn't. Mm. But of course, that's not the game at all. The game is really like the underneath it's really a child saying does my bum look big in this looking for the parental reassurance ah, i like that that's <laughs> a good one I, I think it kind of you can kind of see it in the workplace as well you know if someone's asking for feedback on a piece of work they've done the adult side is like yeah they're looking for feedback you should give it sometimes it's a child asking for just reassurance of just saying yeah no good job good mm. job Susie. yeah it probably comes in any in a whole variety of different ways where someone's asking for just some sort of um compliment 
So the, yeah, the actual right. question makes no sense at all where they're just <laughs> looking right. for a bit of juice. In they, your make it, they make it sound like an adult question, but really it's a child just looking for reassurance or looking for a compliment. Mm. Have you seen a few others? <laughs> hey, there's another one. I call this one, everyone's an idiot except me. This is my dad when he's driving. Is I can't drive with him anymore. Oh, this game. Yeah, I see this all <laughs> the time as well. He's painful. I, I actually, I don't get headaches, but I actually got a headache from being in the car with him mm. just because anything that happens, he'll be like... This this guy this guy's gonna merge this this guy's gonna merge he's gonna make oh my god why how could you possibly merge like that this idiot he's gone from two lanes across he's just jumped over three lanes yeah. and now he's caused and he goes on like one incident yeah. gets him three minutes of material to just hang shit on everyone yeah. and basically I think the the game here is everyone's an idiot except me they're all idiots I'm the only good one who knows what they're doing mm, parent child <laughs> or acting like a parent and everyone else are the little idiot <laughs> That's children. Right. I think driving in general brings that game out all the time, right? Everyone is an idiot except for me. And like you're looking for people to do the smallest oh, stuff up. I'd say some right. bosses have that as well, right? Oh, like yeah, they, someone just doesn't do the re- report or whatever it is in, in, in as classy way as they think they could and they just like smile. They get excited. <laughs> time to play this game. You're an idiot. Yeah, I'm yeah. awesome. Everyone's an idiot except me. So the book can be summarized really in a few different ways. So firstly – you're always acting in three different ego states. You can be a parent, you can be an adult, or you can be a child. And in the games we play, we're going to take on these different roles. We're going to morph in our interactions. Uh, sometimes what we say on the surface doesn't really match what we're saying psychologically beneath the surface. Mm, so things, there's a natural order of different ego states combining and you're not going to have real issues there. So if someone is a parent, you act like a parent, or if someone's a, an adult, you act like a child, or if they're a child, you look like, act like an adult. <laughs> or if you're if they're a child, you act like a child, and you're both being playful. <laughs> when you start crossing them over and together, that's where the the, the the shit starts hitting a bit of the fan. You're gonna have a bit of conflict. Yeah, that's right. When you make an adult statement and they respond with a parental thing saying you shouldn't be doing this, that's when you know, things just go haywire. And things start getting a bit more intense when there's ulterior motives where at the social level you're, you're having something that is working but you're actually trying to stimulate a response from them um, for you to win some sort of game and that's where it gets a bit more intense and those funny games start popping out <laughs> in existence that's right and his final kind of kicker here is that if you kind of recognize these in yourself you can recognize when you're saying things that sounds like an adult statement but really it's a child statement or you can kind of say oh somebody else they said this but I know that's just their parent coming out in them or whatever it is, you can kind of realize, okay, we don't have to play these games anymore. We can kind of just go back to a complimentary adult to adult level. You're just going to be a lot closer to the people around you if you're not playing games. If you're looking for a great new read, or a great read that's a year old and just getting better, head to theshitthenevertaughtyou.com where you can buy our book, The Shit They Never Taught You. We've been getting great feedback from the people. Um, everyone, if you've read the book, feel free to go and leave a review. We love uh, we love hearing it. Uh, LC Judas, he says, the book is made to read and reflect a few pages at a time. It uses an easy-to-read example story style for each concept. Advice is in bite sizes, actionable things, no gimmicks, no buzzwords, no repetitive text. Probably the best book I've ever read in the self-help wow. category. That's, man, we've read some That's bloody good books. So. And it's, I know uh, LC Judas, it sounds like he's read a lot of uh, books That's in the right. self-help and for him to say that, we'll take that. For Appreciate sure. that, LC Judas. If you want to read as something that LC Judas describes as the uh, best book in the self-help category, head to theshitthenevertaughtyou.com.